Welcome back to the show. Before we jump into our little intro for today's episode, I want to remind you to go enter the 100K giveaway. It's really simple. Just go to the show notes. You can do it while you're listening to this episode. Go to the show notes, click the link, submit your email, and you are entered to win enrollment into one of my two programs plus an unmedicated girly swag bag. Okay. So don't forget to enter because I'm going to pick the winner, um, probably on Monday and I keep forgetting to remind you. So here is your reminder. And what we're talking about today in this episode is the dreaded long labor. I think like every mom is wishing and hoping and praying that birth is going to be fast and, and simple, but that's just not always the case. And really, if I'm being completely honest, the only thing you can do to get through a long labor unmedicated is to surrender. But lucky for you, I'm a, I'm a strategy girly. I love a tactical tip. I'm actually going to share three things you can do starting in early labor through like, oh crap, this is getting long (laughs) to help you get through a labor that is long. That's maybe longer than 24 hours. This is not your average birth podcast because you are not the average mom. Welcome to Unapologetically Unmedicated. I'm your host, Fierce Lizzie, and I am unapologetic when it comes to normal, physiologic, unmedicated birth. I want you to have your best birth because I know that an empowered birth leads to an empowered motherhood. If you want to be the boss of your birth and do birth your way, it's time to get informed, educated, and empowered. Did you know that Botox is toxic? It's like, it's literally in the name. I'm sure all of you unmedicated girlies are pretty on board with the no injections rule in general, and you're already avoiding Botox. And you know it's healthier for you, but maybe you still kind of wish you had that baby smooth Botox forehead. That is where frownies come in. Frownies are made from craft paper and food-based adhesive, and that is it. They retrain the muscles in your forehead to one, stop furrowing, and two, to lay completely flat, resulting in a smoother forehead even after the first use. It is the best low tox option. It's safe for pregnancy. It's safe for breastfeeding. So all of you unmedicated girlies who want Botox results, go grab a box. I am obsessed with frownies. It's more affordable than Botox. It's healthier than Botox. And as long as you apply them correctly and you're consistent, they really do work. I will link to the Frownies website in the show notes. Be sure to use code Lizzie for 10% off. I feel like a really long labor is kind of what every pregnant mom is just praying (laughs) doesn't happen. Like, please, please, please let labor be fast. Let it be quick. Let it be easy. Of course, that doesn't always happen. And I mean, I can speak for myself as well. I had a 21 hour labor from the very first sign of labor to my baby being born. It was my first. It was my second. It was 14 hours, again, from the very first sign of labor, which both times was my water breaking, to baby being born. And with my third, I was just like, oh my gosh, I don't want a long labor. Like, why can't I have one of those quick, you know, six hour labors, even, heck, even a two hour labor, you know, I would love a precipitous birth. And that's what I prayed for. And that is also what I prepped for. So I did everything different with my third. It's everything I teach inside of Unmedicated Academy. And I got that precipitous birth. I was only in the hospital for about an hour before she was born. And that was my, that was the plan. That is exactly what I wanted. So there is a little bit of prep work that you can do to try to prevent a labor from being longer than 24 hours. This is a whole topic in and of itself. 
and I actually touch on a lot of those things, a lot of things you can do in your birth prep to help you hopefully have a faster birth that would be a little easier to manage. And I teach this inside of my free birth prep class. So I will link to the birth prep class in the show notes. Definitely check it out. Definitely get started on those birth prep things while you're doing your birth education because some of them ha have a huge impact. For example, um, seeing a chiropractor. So doing chiropractic, I always joke that like, oh, you're drinking Nora and you're doing chiropractic. You better be ready for a fast birth because I swear even my first time moms have faster than faster births than I, than I had, not my precipitous birth, but you know, six, eight, 10 hour, 10 hour births. Okay. So as much as you can preventing that longer labor and doing, doing all those things. Now, of course, there are many moms who will say, I did all those things. I went to the chiropractor. I did the, the stretches and I did the walking and I did the dates and I still had a 20 hour labor or a 30 hour labor. So let's talk about some things you can do in the case of having a long labor, which I mean, long is relative, but I put in the title of this, if it's you know, longer than 24 hours would be, I think pretty long to me. Um, so what are some things you can do if labor is long. The first thing is to ignore early labor as long as possible. Like if I go back to my first two births, the very first sign of labor, my, my water's breaking, which you know, I ended up going into the hospital right away because that's what they tell you to do. So that started my mental clock. You don't want to start that mental clock. Birth is so much mental more than physical. I'll say it right now. Every single one of us can have an unmedicated birth if we put our minds to it, okay? It is 90% mental, 10% circumstantial or, you know, f physical, right? Because there are some physical things that can happen. Um, and also the hospital is a good way to not get your unmedicated birth, which is a another whole podcast episode in itself. But... That's the first tip is to ignore early labor as long as possible. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Looking back at my first births, if my waters hadn't broken or if I didn't count that as the start of labor, I would be here telling another story. If I waited until like active labor, you know, because there's my waters broke and I hadn't started contractions. So if my waters hadn't broke, I wouldn't have even thought I was in labor for another six hours or something, right? That whole early labor that was happening wasn't, it was like, oh, I'm having contractions. Yeah, but they just feel like the Braxton Hicks that I've been having. And it's it's not like wearing you down, right? It's not like when you get to the hospital, now the goal is to leave the hospital, right? You're like, okay, I gotta get this baby out. So like in early labor with my first, I was like walking around. I was doing squats. I was trying to get things moving along. That's not what I should have been doing in early labor. And then with my second, I knew that. And I was in the hospital in early labor for, uh, let's see, cause I got there at midnight and labor didn't pick up until the morning. So like 7 a.m. went right around kind of the shift change. Um, and so imagine if I had been home laying in, in bed and resting, how much faster that labor would have been, how much more comfortable I would have been if I hadn't started that mental clock. So I did know enough to go lay down, but then because I was there for six hours and not showing any progress on the monitor, they were like, oh, we should start thinking about Pitocin. And I was like, uh, no, we shouldn't. And so then I had to, then I had to do that mental game of like, okay, I got to get out of here. Like I got to get labor going. You just shouldn't have to do that. So ignoring early labor as long as possible. And we know one of my top tips for having an unmedicated birth in the hospital is to labor at home as long as possible, okay? But just ignore early labor, okay? Rest, ignore it, go on about your day, do not start that mental clock, okay? Because it's when you know you've been laboring for 24 hours that you start to think, 
I can't do this. I just want to sleep. I just need a break. I mean, you might think those things anyways, but it's a mental game. So don't start that mental clock. Ignore it. I love the stories when I talk to moms and they're like, I was in denial that I was in labor. They have the fastest labors because they didn't start that mental clock yet. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's the first thing. Then the next two things that you should do as soon as labor starts, because you don't know, you don't know if you're going to have a labor that's longer than 24 hours, right? You just don't know. But these two things, if you prioritize them, will help you to have more stamina for a long labor. And those two things are one, prioritizing rest. So kind of like I did where I lay down in early labor, even though I was already in the hospital. Of course, I mean, we can argue that like that wasn't probably very restful because I was in a hospital, right? <laughs> it's definitely not as restful as being home in my bed. Prioritizing rest, especially in early labor, especially in late pregnancy. Sleep is hard at 40 weeks pregnant, at 41 weeks pregnant. You're going to... That exhaustion comes back in late pregnancy for a reason, right? We need to be prioritizing rest. We need to be taking naps, okay? We need to be trying to sleep well at night because we can bank up some rest. You don't want to be, you know, the, the big mistake we see moms is going on a hike or doing all the curb walking or, I don't know, staying up all night having sex to try to get things moving along. And then they're going into labor with an energy deficit. So prioritizing what rest in late pregnancy and in, and in labor, in early labor, and once you see your labor going long, this is why it's so important to understand what the stages of labor look and feel like so that when you're experiencing it, you can know kind of where you are, right? Because you can also prioritize rest there are restful things you can do even in labor to save on energy. Your body's to, your body is going to birth this baby. This is why you, this is why you know, we love the tub, right? Our home birth moms love getting in the water. Some of them will get in the water and they will close their eyes and rest while their body is doing that hard work. Okay? So prioritizing rest from late pregnancy through, oh crap, I'm having a long labor. This isn't the precipitous labor that I prayed for. I need to be prioritizing rest throughout, okay? The second thing to prioritize is fuel. Because you've heard this before, birth is like a marathon in both of those ways. It can be long, it's a, a long trip, and it's like literally just one foot in front of the other and, until you get to that finish line and you could be at mile two and it feels like you can't go anymore and you just keep putting that one foot in front of the other and doing it. Like I've never run a marathon, but I assume that's kind of how it feels to run a marathon. That's why I'm, I'm tired at mile two. So you can't run a marathon on an empty stomach. You see marathon runners, they have their like goo packs and their gummies and you know, you can't eat spaghetti and meatballs while you're running, right? But the same thing applies to labor, that you should be fueling your body. Your uterus is a muscle. It's working really hard. If your muscles are working hard and you're not giving your body the fuel to use as energy for those muscles to work, those muscles are going to fatigue. So it's really, really important to prioritize fueling your body always, we should always be fueling our bodies really well. But like when you are in early labor, prioritizing getting like a good meal in with carbs and protein and fats. And then hopefully you don't throw it up because that does, that does happen sometimes. Uh, but you know, getting a good meal in and then pr continuously throughout labor, eating here and there when you can, of course, like in labor, you don't feel hungry a lot of the times. So that's why it needs to be prioritized. That's why the fuel needs to be prioritized. And you can, 
it's just kind of like the marathon runners. They don't feel hungry. They don't want to eat a big meal. They also don't want to throw everything off. So they have their little foods that work really well for them. So bring those with you. Dried fruits, almond butter packets, peanut butter packets, bars, um, nuts, trail mixes, honey sticks, and also fueling with your uh, liquids. So like coconut water, so you get some sugar, right? You could bring broth if you want. You could bring red raspberry leaf tea or Nora tea. So fueling your body from that very first sign of labor and knowing that you need to do that through to the finish line, through the whole marathon, okay? And planning accordingly. So those, those are the, the best two tips. And of course, some moms will do all of that and they'll hit hour 36, and they just can't do it anymore. And the mom who is not coping well with labor and who is very tense can actually benefit from getting the epidural. That, that mom that has done all the things, has labored for so long, and she decides that the next right tool for her labor is the epidural. That is why moms transfer to hospitals sometimes from home births that are really long. There, there does become a point when that epidural does make sense, even when your plan is an unmedicated birth. And specifically, the mom who's holding a lot of tension, right? She has so much tension and she can't rest her body enough to birth her baby, will be able to release that tension once that epidural is in place. So even though I am unapologetically for unmedicated birth and I don't like you know, the risks that come with the epidural, it does make sense as the next right step in some of these labors that are really long. It allows mom to, to rest. It allows mom to um, fuel up because she now is not experiencing pain and she's no longer tense. And uh, it can, so it can help you be able to fuel. It can uh, help you release that tension. And for a lot of those moms, as soon as they get the epidural, here comes their baby being born. So as much as I am always talking about no interventions, unmedicated birth, go have a home birth. Of course, this goes without saying that those interventions are there for a reason. And um, it, they, can, they, they should be used responsibly. And that would be a responsible use of the epidural is a mom that has labored for so long and, and is exhausted. And really what, what you want to avoid is planning an unmedicated birth, wanting to avoid the epidural, and then making the decision to have the epidural be that next step without having tried all the tools in the toolkit first. Because I think that is really when moms are more disappointed Um like that mom, that example of the mom who was really, really tense. There are unmedicated ways to manage that. But if you don't have that toolkit, you just don't know the other ways to, to manage when labor gets rough besides the epidural, right? Which is typically the hospital's go-to tool in the toolkit, unfortunately. And this is why in Unmedicated Academy, we build a toolkit together. We practice the toolkit. And I go over ways to avoid the epidural so that you can feel confident in the epidural being the last resort. So you can have a bunch of things to try before resorting to the epidural so that you actually have options when labor gets hard, when it gets too hard to handle. If you enjoyed this episode, I know you're going to love my birth program. Unmedicated Academy is a comprehensive birth education that is not only going to have you feeling prepared, educated, and confident for your birth, but you'll also walk away knowing all of your options, all of your birth rights, and have killer advocacy skills so that you hold the power in your birth. The podcast is just a little taste of what you'll get inside the program. Are you ready to go all in? You can learn more about Unmedicated Academy at fiercelizzy.com slash academy.